In this assessment, we're asked to give the structure that corresponds to the spectrum shown. Now, at this point, for this particular assessment and where it is in the chapter, um, this is going to be a challenging problem, right? This is going to be difficult to work through because we're just now learning NMR. What this assessment is meant to do is to show you how even with the limited understanding of the background theory, you can still piecemeal your way through and, and come up with a structure. It will be easier as we go on. So if you struggle with this assessment, don't sweat it. You've got lots of lots more coming, lots more background theory that's going to fill in some of the gaps that in some ways this assessment has created for you. So uh, let's start. Uh, we always want to start with the molecular formula at C5H10. Oh, we know that then that there are five carbons. We're going to be uh, having 10 hydrogens. And if you notice the integration values for these, we've got two, three, two, and three. They're going to actually add up. My pointing was a little off, but they're going to add up to 10. So all 10 hydrogens are represented in this spectrum. We should have five carbons. We should have one oxygen. Uh, what else does that uh, molecular formula tell us? It tells us the index of hydrogen deficiency. So we can calculate the index of hydrogen deficiency as being equal to one. So the index of hydrogen deficiency calculation that I'll use is the number of carbons times two, that quantity plus two. So five times two plus two would be 12, minus the number of hydrogens, which is 10, minus the number of halogens, which is zero. Uh, we don't have to make a correction for nitrogen because there are no nitrogens, and we don't have to do anything with the number of oxygens. So we subtract all of that or do subtract 10 from that, divide that number by 2, and we end up with 12 minus 10 divided by 2, index of hydrogen deficiency of 1. What does that tell us? That tells us that there's at least one pi bond or one ring in this molecule. Now, with that information, how can we use it? Well, for one, we can imagine types of functional groups that might be present. We might have an alkene, we might have a ring, and we might have a carbonyl. Now again, this spectrum gives us some of that information. Uh, if you notice, we have peaks that show up between, or signals that show up between 2.5 and 2. Those are going to be typical of hydrogens that are next door to carbonyl. They're on carbons that are next door to carbonyl, so carbon-oxygen double bonds. The chemical shifts here kind of jump out, us, jump out at us in conjunction with the index of hydrogen deficiency and make us believe that there's a carbonyl present in this molecule. Uh, the spectrum actually cuts off at, at, at around three. If there had been an alkene, we would have expected to see a signal around five or, or six. Uh, we wouldn't have seen a, sing, a, sing, a signal for a ring, but if we hadn't seen any other signals that indicated something like a carbon oxygen double bond or a carbon carbon double bond, then we might imagine a ring. Now again, this seems like a great time to say, hey, this might be complicated right now, but Stick with it and, and you'll get there. So let, let's keep going. Uh, the other thing that we, we do when we look at a spectrum like this is, is we just treat each signal as a piece of the puzzle. And so let's lay out what is each signal telling us. And we'll start with the higher chemical shift values and work uh, left to right. So we'll identify our first signal at a chemical shift. We'll use this lowercase delta chemical shift of around 2.5. Uh, notice that it integrates to two, that's a value that's given in the chart. It's gonna to integrate to two. It has a multiplicity of being a triplet. And therefore, we know that it's going to have a certain number of neighbors just barely out of space. How many neighbors does it have? If it's a triplet, we take the three lines minus one that means there are two neighbors. So the peak, the first peak we've identified is at 2.5, integrates to two, multiplicity of two, and therefore two neighbors. Uh, let's continue laying out the pieces of our puzzle the way we would if we were trying to construct a puzzle. Uh, at 2.1, we have a, a singlet. It integrates to three, so we went out of order there. It integrates to three and that integral value is given. What that tells us is that there are three hydrogens that make up that signal. At 2.5, two hydrogens made up that signal. Uh, multiplicity of being a singlet 
minus one means that there are zero neighbors. So those hydrogens have no neighbors next to them, right? The signal, these three hydrogens are next door directly to no hydrogens. That's going to be important for uh, figuring out the, the structure. Uh, the next peak we'll look at is at a chemical shift of around 1.6. Uh, it integrates to two, so two hydrogens are responsible for giving that signal. Uh, it is a sextet. Being a sextet, n minus one is to subtract one. Six minus one is five. There are five neighbors. So how could you have five neighbors? Carbon can only have four hydrogens. To have five neighbors means you probably are between two carbons with three and two hydrogens. We'll get to that in just a second. Uh, the last peak, the last signal that we'll look at is around 1. Uh, it is integrating to 3, so 3 hydrogens make that signal. It is a triplet. And as a triplet means there are two neighbors, so two neighbors. We can take the multiplicity and subtract 1 to know how many neighbors are, uh, how many hydrogens neighbor the three hydrogens that give the chemical shift of 1.0. So having tabulated all of this, we're now ready to guess or to make a prediction of what each piece of the puzzle looks like. So um, here, and this is something best learned by doing, so let, let's just jump right in. Uh, the, the peak at 2.5, it integrates to two, okay? There are two ways that you can have two hydrogens. You can have a CH and a CH, where both of them are equivalent, or you can have a CH2. When you're doing NMR, always start simply, right? Start with this, make the simple assumption. We may find out later on that we're wrong, but we're going to make a guess that this peak at 2.5 represents a CH2. And I'm going to underline those two hydrogens, and I'm going to do that to indicate that the peak at 2.5 that integrates the two is telling us that these two hydrogens are present. Why is that important? Well, the, the reason that's important is because we also have information about the number of neighbors. So these two hydrogens that are indicated by this peak at 2.5 are next door to two other hydrogens. Now, it could be a CH on one side and a CH on the other, but we're keeping it simple. So we're gonna assume that that CH2 is next door to another CH2. What else do we know about this 2.5? Well, the other thing we know about the 2.5 is that chemical shift falls in the range of being next door to a carbonyl. And so we can make a guess at this point that this CH2 that is at 2.5 that integrates to 2 is probably next door to the carbonyl. And we'll put an R to say we don't know what else is on the other side of that. Right? But we have an idea from the chemical shift that these two hydrogens are next door to the carbonyl. We can do the same thing at 2.1. At 2.1, we now are integrating to 3. Okay, so our guess, right, that's probably going to be a CH3. We'll underline, underline that hydrogen to say that the, the 2.1 indicates three hydrogens, a CH3. Now, what's it next to? Well, it's got zero neighbors. Right? We know that whatever it's attached to with, with three hydrogens, we can only have one other bond, and whatever it's attached to has zero neighbors. That chemical shift is telling us something else again. Being in that range of 2 to 3, 2.1 to 2.5, right? being in that range suggests next door to a carbonyl. So this CH3 might also be next to a carbonyl. We'll put an R because we don't know what's on the other side, or do we? In fact, we do know what's on the other side, this group here. So when we, when we make these guesses, you might look at this and say, oh, or do we have two carbonyls in the molecule? No, we don't. We have one carbonyl, but this carbonyl and this carbonyl are the same. And so we've kind of started to piece together that we've got a CH2 and a CH2 on one side of it, a CH3 on the other side. I think at this point, you can start to see how we're going to end up putting the structure together uh, if we continue this. So, so let's, let's do that. Let's continue. Uh, the peak at 1.6, it integrates to 2. So we're going to assume we have another CH2. Underlining it because the 1.6, that chemical shift the 1.6, is telling us specifically we have a CH2. What's it next to? Well, it's got five neighbors. 
So we could we could go through and say, well, is it next to a CH5? Not possible. Next to a CH4? Also not possible. The only way to have five neighbors, if you're carbon, is to have three hydrogens on one side and two hydrogens on the other. So our guess is going to be that this CH2 is between a CH3 and a CH2. Now there's a really cool thing that happens in NMR is that as we're making this table, we, we, we're getting feedback about our previous guesses. So follow, follow along with this. This 2.5 told us we had a CH2 and we hypothesized that it was next door to a CH2. What that means is we should have another signal somewhere in the molecule that tells us we have a CH2. Good news, we do. And that CH2 had as one of its neighbors a CH2. And so we can circle these in yellow, and, and I, I don't want to mess up the, the drawing too much, but this CH2 that we're speculating as a neighbor is actually this CH2. So a CH2, there's a signal that tells us this CH2 is present. There's a neighbor that is a CH2, which helps us, kind of re reinforces that we're on the right track. Uh, Adam refers it to it as the reciprocity of NMR, and, and we see that happening here. At our chemical shift of one, it integrates the three. So we know we have a CH3. We'll underline that because that peak at one corresponds to that. It's a triplet, so it has two neighbors. The easiest way to have two neighbors is to be next door to a CH2. We can see that reciprocity playing out once again because this CH2 we believed was going to be next door to a CH3, and now we found a CH3 that's next door to a CH2. And so this CH2 and this CH2 are probably the same. From here, if you look at what we've identified, and, and now I'm going to write this down below, we've got a CH3 that is connected to a CH2. Now I'm going to point to this CH2 that we speculate that it's next to, but this CH2 we said is actually this CH2. So we, we said CH2 is a neighbor of the CH3, and here's the signal, so we know that there's a CH2. So we can kind of follow the chain. This CH3 goes through this CH2 here, first as a neighbor, here as an actual signal. This CH2 is next door to a CH2, which is that one. So we have a CH2 there. That CH2 was next to a carbonyl. We'll write this in a better way in just a second. And this carbonyl was also next to that CH3. One, two, three, four, five carbons, a singlet, a triplet, a pentet, a triplet, integrating to three, two, two, three. Chemical shifts match up. Our molecule, we can draw it uh, the way organic chemists would. The molecule here is two pentet. Just to reiterate, and I know this video has probably going to be set the record for the longest in the, the YouTube assessments, so hopefully you, you've watched it on double speed or triple speed. Uh, this is not supposed to be easy right now. This is early in the chapter. This is just to show you where you're going. Uh, when you finish the chapter, come back and work this one again, and you'll see how much more quickly you're able to go through it and, and how much more it makes sense. The key, if, if, if you've learned, taken nothing away from this video, be systematic. Go slow, take your time, write down what you know, and then do your best at putting the pieces of the puzzle together. Uh, it will be easier than this, I promise. Good luck.